everyone. Welcome to Mental Health Mondays. I am Carrie Biscalonis with Reset Brain and Body, here to talk to you about something that is incredibly timely, relevant, and important, and it's how to help our kids when they're struggling. We are approaching almost a year in the pandemic, and our kids, while resilient, have never before experienced this amount of stress, change, anxiety, isolation, loneliness, and depression. So what do we do? I'm here with you. I see you. I've been listening to you. I'm seeing your kids in our community struggling. I feel the guilt and the helplessness that you too might feel as a parent in this community going through what we've been going through over the last year. So I wanna sit with you today. I wanna to answer your questions. I wanna hold your hand. I wanna sit with you in this feeling of just overwhelming helplessness and tell you how you can actually help. So the first thing that we have to do is to believe someone's struggles. I can't tell you how many times someone comes up to me and says, you know, no one believes me. I would say I'm depressed, but they, they, they just think I'm seeking attention. They just think that I'm being dramatic. I know this feeling because I remember when I was a kid, I was called a drama queen. And it still is a shame story that comes up for me anytime I feel like I have a real emotion to share. And so we have to believe people's struggle. We have to validate their experience. Even if you might look at your kid and say, you have it so much easier than I did when I was your age, this and this and this happened, I didn't even have DVR. Okay, that's not the point. We have to believe someone's story. We cannot just negate it as them seeking attention or trying to get out of school. That's, that's just something we can't do. Because when someone says, hi, I'm struggling, I need help, I'm feeling bad, we have to believe them. So number one, fundamental, believe someone in their struggle. The second thing, and as humans, we really have a hard time with this, is that we have to sit in someone's pain. We have to be super uncomfortable. And we don't like that. It's uncomfortable to sit with someone in their pain. It's uncomfortable to sit with someone when they're crying, when they're hypoventilating, when they're feeling so low but we have to. That is what we are here to do, to build connection, to validate, to hold someone's hand, to give them a hug, to just let them talk and process. And it's not to fix, it's not to provide solutions, it's not to say, well, you should do this and this and this. No, that's not helpful. That's not helpful at all. Just be with them. Our kids are experiencing grief. And grief is something that doesn't have a quick fix. It's constantly having to adapt and evolve every time your expectations are, are, are not met, every time you feel a wave of disappointment of, wow, this isn't the future that I imagined. You feel like you've been robbed. You're nostalgic for what was, what was before. We have to sit with our kids in their grief. We have to sit with them with their loneliness, their fears, their feelings of being a failure, their insecurities, we just have to sit and be there with them. And that might mean that you're uncomfortable. That might mean you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. This is weird. Like they're in pain. I like, ugh. yeah, that's what it is to sit in pain. It's uncomfortable. So we have to learn how to do it better. Truly sit with someone in their pain. Okay. We always say, you're not alone. You're not alone, don't worry, it's okay, you're not alone. But where are the examples of that? How does someone actually feel assured that they're not alone? Is it because you have family dinner every night? Is it because you pick them up from school? Is it because you tuck them in at bed? That's not enough. It's not enough. They have to see support everywhere that they are not alone. They have to see it at school, they have to see it at sports practice, they have to see it at home, they have to see it amongst friends, they have to see it online, that they are actually not 
alone. And this is bigger than just the family, right? This is bigger than what parents are able to supply. And I understand that and I empathize with that. This is a systemic issue in which if we say you're not alone, we actually have to show up and we have to prove it. But we have to demand it. We have to say, okay, if our kids are saying, you know, I'm struggling and we're saying, well, you're not alone, it's okay. You're not alone, I'm here for you. We have to show up. So let's all from the ground level say we need more. We need more resources. We need more mental health specialists. We need more people supporting our kids because the class sizes are too big and there's not enough social workers at each campus to help our kids. One school psychologist for five schools isn't enough. One part-time behavioral specialist in an entire elementary school is not enough. We have to fight, we have to advocate so that our kids truly do know they're not alone. We have to ask our employers, hey, I can't work as much as you're saying I need to work. I need time off. I need to take care of my children so they know they are not alone. I need to be able to pick them up. I need to be able to sit with them when they're not feeling well. I can't be pinged by emails and conference calls. But we have to advocate for that. We have to change the system. And we can only do that by sharing our voice. Culturally, things have never been more intense for our kids. We know this, we see it even before COVID. The amount of activities and rushing around and the stress that parents have these days of working so much. Our kids have never experienced this much pressure and stress. The academic expectations have never been as big as they are now. And now we're asking our kids to learn in an environment that they have never learned in before and teachers to teach an environment they've never taught in before and parents to support their kids and be there in an environment while working and managing the household in an environment they've never done before. Culturally, this is a whole year of chronic stress. Of course it shows up as mental health issues. Of course it shows up as anxiety and depression. So we have to acknowledge that. We have to realize that our expectations cannot be the same they've ever been. It is unfair to us and all of our kids we cannot continue to expect the same results in a system right now that is experiencing so much chronic stress and trauma. We use so much of our mental energy trying to make decisions just having to do with our health and safety in this last year. We don't have the capacity then to thrive in all the areas of our life. We need sleep. We need rest. And right now we're not getting it and our kids are not either. Every decision feels insurmountable. And that takes an effect on our mental health. We cannot deny the trauma and the impact of trauma this last year. And so of course our kids are failing. Of course you feel like a failure. We cannot expect us to operate at the same level we've operated at before, and we can't expect that out of our kids either. Today, my son was not feeling the greatest. My nanny called out sick. We were scrambling, trying to get everything together, trying to take care of both boys. And I asked my son, I sat down, because he was acting out, and I said, hey bud, I love you. Do you know that? Do you know that I love you? And in his little three and a half year old head, he said, no. I said, oh man, okay, well, I love you. How can I show you that you're loved? How do you know that you're loved? And my three and a half year old said, when you read a book to me. So I stopped everything I was doing. I sat down and I read a book to him. We have to ask our kids how they know they're loved. It's not our assumption. We have to actually hear it from them. Maybe for one of them, it's a car ride. Maybe for another one, it's talking at before bed. Maybe it's playing video games together. Maybe it's going out and taking a walk. We cannot assume that we know how they know that they're loved and that we're speaking the same language. So ask your kids, speak their love language. Be with them. Our kids are experiencing loneliness and they tell us they're experiencing loneliness. I feel alone. I'm so lonely. And we say, ah, you just have to deal with being lonely. It's no big deal. Come on, you'll be fine. 
Everyone's feeling lonely right now. But even before COVID, our kids were feeling lonely. And the reason is because they're not getting attention that's present. You might be with your kid, but you're on the phone. You might be with your kid, but you're responding to emails on your phone or you're scrolling on Instagram or Facebook and I get it, it happens. We are in a time when our smartphones are attached to us. These last 10 years are like nothing else that we've ever experienced with always being on and always being distracted. Our kids feel that. Wouldn't you feel lonely if you're out to dinner and someone's on their phone the whole time? Wouldn't you feel lonely if you were in the car with someone and they were taking a conference call the whole time? Even when our kids are in a group, they feel lonely because people are distracted and they're not giving them attention. We need to give our kids undivided attention. And I'm not saying all day, I'm saying 20 minutes a day. That's it, 20 minutes a day. They need undivided attention. No smartphones, no other kid around. Just you and them, 20 minutes, engaging, talking, sitting with their feelings. We cannot keep being distracted. We are creating loneliness because we are not actually present with one another. And the last thing I'm gonna to offer to you, and I know this is all kind of hard to feel and hard to sit with, but this is so important that we have to rise up and do better as a community for our children. When our children say things like, I'm a burden, I don't wanna worry you with that, I'm not gonna share with you because I don't want you to give you one more thing to stress out about, we need to listen, we need to stop and listen. When they say, I don't know if this is ever gonna end, I don't know if I'm ever gonna be feeling better, this is just too much, this is how it's gonna be the rest of my life, we need to stop and we need to listen. When they say they feel alone, we need to stop and we need to listen. Because anytime a kid says that I'm a burden, this is intolerable and I'm alone, they feel that and that it will never end and never change. And here's the thing, we need to remember our kids' brains are not developed. And through the primary part of their life, until they are fully grown and out of college, they are operating out of their emotional brain. They are not operating out of their rational decision-making brain. They are operating by their emotions, their feelings. And what that means then is that they have so little impulse control. If you're always reacting from your feelings, you're always reacting from your feelings. So when a kid says and feels like a burden, alone, and that this pain will never go away, what will they do with that? Even if it's just for a moment, that feeling overrides all other senses and rational thinking. We cannot expect our kids to take these intense feelings and do something smart with it. Not right now, not all the time. So again, we have to stop and listen. Thank you for listening right now. Just paying attention right now means you're showing up. And we are gonna help these kids, we are. The intent is there, the love is there. We just have to let them know that it's there. We have to be there. Take care of yourself.